What are some of the relative contraindications and risk factors for a poor outcome? during cerclage placement. One, is cervical dilation greater than three centimeters? Two, active labor. Does that mean the presence of contractions alone are a contraindication? No, because oftentimes when the cervix has changed significantly, contractions will ensue. It's part of this continuum of preterm labor and cervical insufficiency. But it is a relative counter, uh, contraindication. If there's an increase in the maternal white blood count to suggest infection or evidence of uterine tenderness or fever, the cerclage is probably best not placed. Prolapse of membranes completely into the vagina is a very poor prognostic factor. Usually, as a result of this prolapse, the membranes become very thin, and if not broken during the course of the procedure, are at very high risk for premature rupture, even if replaced into the endocervical canal. In addition, the presence of the membranes in the vagina, which is not a very sterile environment, almost always leads to infection. Under desperate situations when there's no chance of fetal survival without an effort placing a cerclage, we will frequently attempt to do this. But again, the success is very poor. If there is a malodorous or purulent vaginal discharge, even in the absence of uterine tenderness and elevated white counter maternal fever, there's an increased risk that affection or chorioamnionitis is already established. If there is weeping of amniotic fluid across the membranes, the chance of success is low. If you see denuding of the membranes, so that the chorion is separated or absent from the am amnion, the chance of success is low. And if the patient has failed a cerclage earlier in the pregnancy, the chance of success is low. Over the years, we have been highly successful in management of the patient between 16 and 26 weeks with advanced cervical change. As mentioned previously, more than 80 or 90 percent of the cerclages placed here are ultrasound or clinically indicated cerclages. What have been some of the possible reasons for our success? In my mind, the empiric therapy that I began using 25 years ago or longer has contributed to the excess. And what is that empiric therapy? During mid-trimester cerclage placement in the patient who has advanced cervical change, having an ultrasound indicated cerclage or clinically indicated cerclage, I routinely use an antibiotic cocktail which consists of either penicillin or ampicillin or cephalosporin given for two to three doses around the time of the procedure itself. Added to this cocktail is azithromycin and we use the regular five-day course 
with the first dose being administered prior to the procedure and then completing the course after the procedure. And metronidazole. Metronidazole we use 500 milligrams one to three times per day in the perioperative period and then one to two times per day postoperatively and indefinitely until beyond 34 weeks gestation. My preference is to begin each of these antibiotics at least one to two hours prior to the procedure in the patients at low risk for imminent delivery. In patients with advanced cervical change, however, I've sometimes found it useful to wait eight to 12 hours Because if chorioamnionitis, uterine infection, is driving the procedure, driving the cervical change at that point, usually it will result in continued contractions and delivery before the opportunity to place a stitch is achieved. One of the other things we do to treat empirically in mid-trimester, again, not the prophylactic cerclage that's done early in pregnancy, but in mid-trimester I add endometh endomethacin, depending on the patient's size, usually a first dose of 100 milligrams, and then 25 to 50 milligrams every six hours for 48 to 72 hours. This approach is again empiric, it is not proven. But the success rate here over time makes me very reluctant to consider changing this approach. And there seems to be very low morbidity for the patient associated with it. What is the follow-up of the patient who has had a mid-trimester cerclage in particular? One is to continue ultrasound surveillance. That's transvaginal ultrasound of the cervix to assess cervical length. Indeed, we'll continue this up to 26 to 28 weeks gestation. There are many circumstances in which the cervix will continue to change despite the cerclage placement, where an opportunity arises to replace the cerclage and prolong the pregnancy. This helps to detect that. We do not routinely, do not routinely use tocolysis, either procardia or prolonged use of indomethacin or ibuprofen, and never terbutaline administered orally to these patients because of their increased risk of infections. One of the things we have considered using in recent years is progesterone supplementation. Again, this is at present unproven in the management of a patient with true cervical insufficiency once a cerclage has been placed. However, there is good data to suggest that progesterone therapy alone for the shortened cervix can reduce the risk of preterm labor and delivery. My choice for progesterone therapy with a cervical cerclage is to actually use a vaginal preparation, either cream or tablets or suppositories, of 90 to 100 milligrams administered nightly when the patient can rest for at least a couple of hours without getting up. In conclusion, it is my belief that cervical cerclage still has a very important role in the management of the patient with cervical insufficiency and even patients at risk for preterm labor and delivery. The only way to judge as to whether a cerclage might be indicated mandates the use of either routine screening for cervical insufficiency in the 18 to 22 week range 
were a very low threshold for screening for risk factors and evidence of cervical change at the time of routine ultrasound. We have seen in our state alone a significant reduction in the rate of very low birth weight babies. And I have to believe that our success with cervical cerclage in recent years has contributed to this decline. And ultimately, a decline in healthcare costs for the management of these patients.